Ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats, please. We'll get started for this afternoon's session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our second AUSA Tech in 10, entitled Stop the Insanity, Enabling the Deployment of Heavy Armor. This should be good. Uh, it, our presenter is Colonel Mark Davis, the United States Army retired problem solver with the Improv Group. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Good afternoon. I want to go ahead and address today uh, some mental health issues, particularly the insanity that's happening and has been going on for the past 70 years in regards to the employment of heavy armor on the battlefield. A smart person once said, doing the same thing over again is insanity, and that's exactly what we have going on right now. A lot of you don't have hairs because you've been pulling it out, especially if you're a logistician and a uh, division movement officer trying to get armor from the port to the rail to the attack position. How is it and how insane is it that we're handcuffed to vulnerable ports and rail terminals? Political turbulence, A2AD, asymmetric threats, and just flat out poor infrastructure and a lack of capacity at these ports, which are also very vulnerable. So I ask you, is this what modern warfare looks like? To me, it looks like insanity. Railing heavy armor has not changed in the last 70 years. Maybe the cranes have changed, maybe the rojo has changed, but essentially that picture is in Latvia about four months ago. It has not changed. Current ramps haven't changed. I would characterize them as MacGyvers. You have cannibalized AVLBs in Europe. In Korea, you have locally procured uh, ramps that require another crane to move it around isn't good for rail, isn't good for mobility, and then you have U.S. Commercial vendors, without talking to clients, have developed things that just won't work. They're not safe, they're not expeditionary, they're not agile, and they're not useful. Possible contingencies. What now? What happens if your assumptions, which you have to have to continue planning, the ports, the railheads, are going to be okay? You can make those assumptions, but you've got to have a plan to mitigate what's going to happen when the railhead's damaged, when the port can't go to there because of either host nation won't let you or because it's been under attack, or maybe an asymmetric threat against a crane operator, which allows him not to come to work because of fear of his family. So not only are the ports a critical vulnerability, the railheads are a critical vulnerability, but the cranes which are pri the primary method and means by which we're heavy or we're putting this armor on top of rail cars um, are critical vulnerabilities. This is what modern warfare looks like. Mobile agile, portable ramp systems. It's a two-part system. It's simple. It's a mat, steel mat that goes over any gauge rail system that allows that 93.5 short ton tank to pivot on that railhead anywhere along the rail line, forget the port. If the port's not good or you have to move to an austere area that doesn't have that facility, you can use the rail map. The other part is a, an 11 piece modular set that is the heaviest piece is 2,800 pounds. It's portable, key characteristics. It takes two people to put this thing together, has no bolts, no parts. You can move it with a bobcat loader. You can, you can move it to attack position. So some of you guys are probably saying, well, that's fine and dandy, but, that, but what if you get into an extremist situation? Well, look at this. This is the current way we're doing it. This is an ABCT data given to me by uh, user. Right now, it takes 22 days. With my system, with just one system at Antwerp, I can do it 50% faster, and you don't have to go to three different ports and use line haul from those locations. Because enemy is your, t enemy is your biggest uh, time is your biggest enemy, and he's lethal, all right? And an improved group, when, when we try to look at things, we look at try to how to shrink that time from the RSOI to the attack position. And if I can reduce that, and we can get combat power there, that increases your likelihood of success on the battlefield. Because when you do get in those in extremist situations, when someone punches you in the face and your plan goes awry, 
our portable ramp system is there for you to recover. Because right now, you really don't have an option. If your rail line is damaged, what do you do? On this one, you can do an extremist offload anywhere. Imagine that, anywhere. You can actually do distributed armor operations and kick out those battalions, those brigades off of the rail line versus traveling past and going to a port or a railhead and then having to move into the attack position. And that's what this does. Simple Atlas loader on the back of it when you know you're going to get into a kerfuffle and you just take that thing, the Atlas loader then builds it out and then you roll that tank off of there. Same thing with the terminals, the ports. In Antwerp, for instance, there's one ramp but there's five rail spurs. You buy three or four of these ramps, guess what? You've now cut down your time to move an ABCT, 1,091 rail cars, thousands of pieces of equipment in about four days. It increases throughput. It also provides you that ability that if the port is not available and you have to then go to a backup port that may not have the infrastructure, this ramp is there because this ramp will go anywhere it's even configured where we can put it in for the Pacific Rim in a C-130 option. So let's wrap it up. Our portable ramp, heavy armor, increases throughput, accelerates offloading by as much as 50 to 75 percent. It increases your options because right now you don't have options. Your options when you get in a place where the rail line is damaged, you have to improvise. If you if you know that their possibility is there, why not have a system in order to overcome those challenges? And it allows for swarming of armor anywhere on the battlefield. Think about the possibilities. This system changes your planning considerations. I know this because I was a planner at UConn for 10 years, and I know that if I had this system, I wouldn't have to make those assumptions that, that were probably not going to happen anyway. So here it is. At Improve Group, we do a lot of things. Most of the time is we talk to clients and we solve problems. We just don't make tank ramps. We solve solutions. And essentially, we do a lot of things between heavy armor uh, ramps to heavy armor loading, configured expeditionary, to high density modular building. Our systems can put 240 soldiers in a, in a span of a 70 by 100, or for this one, which is truly expeditionary, 44 people in the same configuration as an Alaska tent. Rack box, how many people have lived out of a 20-foot container? You continually dump it in, dump it out, where our container systems fit into your containers and are a heck of a lot cheaper than a, than a BOH. Expeditionary maintenance, Pakaloa Training Center, Rodriguez uh, Range, these are places that are bridging solutions to Milcon. DLA, procurable. And oh, by the way, some of our systems have been on installations for as long as 17 years. Rolling stock, great for APSs. We can rack 30,000 pounds vertical. That means I can take a warehouse that has 57,000 square feet and turn it into 336,000 cubic feet, saving you millions of dollars that you'd otherwise have to invest in a Milcon project that you're probably not going to get uh, funded, but you can do this again. This requires no installation. Your own soldiers can assembly this. Cargo racks. We have been putting up cargo racks all the way from Afghanistan in Japan, to Japan uh, to Europe. Our stuff can vertically rack 15 to 25,000 pounds per position. And again, you tell me how you want it, and I'll basically build it to your specs. Class 4 yards. We're building SSAs and class 4 yards all over the world. Most of the places I go, whether it's the 25th ID or 7th ID, no vertical racking at all. No vertical racking at any of the SSAs. We can vertical rack anything. It's warehouse space optimization. We're doing space optimization with the Air Force with, with their deployed air base systems because they can't do MILCON out on the frontier. So we have to then consolidate their uh, systems, therefore saving them millions of dollars. In one particular uh, client, they had, I was able to put six warehouses into one because I was able to go vertical. Convoy and port, and, and port kits. We don't only look at single systems, we're an integrator. This came out of uh, our client, uh, the 21st TSC, Major General Shapiro. He goes, look, I'm spending a lot of money at the ports. 
I'm spe I, I don't have a plan for when my convoys go. I need a ready-made expeditionary system to put folks together, to feed them, to billet them, to command and control, and to do it 24 hours a day. And this is one of those systems that we put together. We can scale this big or small depending on what the footprint is. One of those tents right there can hold 240 packs. So at this particular installation, you're talking almost 900 people in a very small condensed area. So again, at Improve Group, we don't sell products. I don't have a catalog. My products come out of your brain and into my design guys, and then I go out and build it for you. So I thank you very much for this opportunity. And come by Booth 203 so you can see the wide portfolio of things that we can do for you. Well, thanks, Mark, uh, for that intriguing uh, presentation. I think uh, uh, lots of things to take a look at. And again, I encourage you to swing by and, uh, and, and see Colonel Davis uh, when we, when we uh, break up this afternoon. Uh, it's now my, my great privilege to introduce our keynote uh, speaker for this afternoon uh, to, to get us kicked off on, on afternoon number two here at, at LANPAC. And we truly are privileged uh, to have the commander of United States Indo-Pacific Command uh, join us. You've got Admiral Davison's bio on your app because I know you all have downloaded your app and you, you have access to that. But, but I would tell you just to start, he's a, a 1982 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. We heard from a 1982 graduate of the United States Military Academy this morning. Um, so maybe just a little bit of a rivalry there. He is a native of, of St. Louis. And, and here in, in Waikiki, which I know is a hotbed of National Hockey League fandom, uh, you'll uh, recognize that the St. Louis Blues are now into the, into the Stanley Cup Finals. If uh, General Milley was, was here, he would probably take you on and give him the Boston Bruins and the, and the St. Louis Blues. In fact, Admiral Davis and I, I shared a note with uh, General Milley over the, the lunch period. I told him that, that, uh, that you were going to be the, the leadoff speaker for this afternoon. And, Unsurprisingly, General Milley, who's captured in Washington, D.C., was like, can I get out there, like, right now for the presentation? So, so he's a little bit jealous of you. Uh, I would tell you, having had the, the privilege of, of serving alongside Admiral Davidson in the, uh, at, on the Joint Staff a number of years ago, um, if, if you tailor-made uh, an officer to be the commander of United States Indo-Pacific Command, you'd look for an officer that is, that is uh, supremely grounded and well-qualified at the tactical level. And Admiral Davidson is that, uh, both ashore uh, and afloat. You would look for someone who has a, a wide array of operational assignments in his, in, his, uh, in his parent service, but also in the joint and combined world. And you would look at this level for an officer, for a commander who has strategic vision, who has the understanding of not only U.S. national security, but a broad understanding uh, of international relations, interagency activities, and Admiral Davidson's experience uh, across the interagency and in international assignments makes him exceedingly uh, well qualified to serve as our commander here in the Pacific. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please a warm welcome for Admiral Phil Davidson, Commander United States Indo-Pacific Command. Good afternoon, aloha. <clears throat> ah, very good. You all got indoctrinated. Uh, thank you, General Ham, for the introduction. Uh, I have to say, you know, General Ham has been a mentor to me, both, I think, directly and probably unbeknownst to him, indirectly, uh, going on a dozen years now. He's been most helpful to my own professional development. So I thank you, General Ham, for your continued service to the nation in this role here, uh, and for the very kind introduction. I also want to say hello and uh, good afternoon to General Brown and uh, General Abrams. I know they've both had the opportunity to speak with you already. Um, hopefully they covered 95% of my ground. Um, I apologize if I repeat anything they had to say. Um, General Abrams uh, has a tall order. Uh, it's been a distinct pleasure to work in partnership with him over the last uh, seven months, I guess, uh, now together. Uh, on the problems that uh, face us when it comes to uh, North Korea. Uh, and uh, despite the 
differences in uh, alma maters. I think the kinship we have in uh, being co-1982ers has been most helpful. I, mean, I know uh, General Brown, we spend quite a bit of time uh, together here in Hawaii talking about the Army's vision for the future and our collective vision for uh, the Indo-Pacific, and uh, he's been an important partner as well, so I'm grateful for both their service and for being here today. Um, I, this is my first land pack, probably no surprise to anybody. Um, I just spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about it in the car with, the, with my folks on the way down here, and I know that they're doing a tremendous job, and it was a, a pleasure to see some of the booths uh, out front just now. And it is also great to see all the general officers uh, and others that are here in attendance today, as well as all those from the allies and partner uh, network that we enjoy. I, spent, I intend to make uh, the focus of my remarks uh, to that international audience for the most part. Um, so um, uh, please bear with me if you're a U.S. only audience, uh, but I hope uh, General Brown filled that in. 28 nations, other nations, here with us at LANPAC today, uh, representing nations from all across the Indo-Pacific. And I'd like to thank you specifically for making this long trip uh, to such an important event. And if you take nothing else away uh, from my conversation and certainly the conversation of all the interlocutors that are here today, I hope you will recognize that we are in this together and a uh, partner that you can rely on. The theme for this year's land pack hit the mark regarding the theater applicability a free and open Indo-Pacific, innovative and agile land forces expertly describes America's need for the land component in this theater, a land component that knows the world is evolving. Whether on the blue continent of Oceania, the Pacific Island chain, operating in the archipelagic environment of Southeast Asia, responding to a natural disaster in South Asia, or exercising in Northeast Asia, we cannot realize our collective goals in the Indo-Pacific without securing the land domain. Our vision at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command is to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific alongside a constellation of like-minded allies and partners united by mutual security, interests, and values in order to deter adversary aggression, protect the homeland, and be ready to fight and win in armed conflict. I'll frame my remarks today around how I view the land domain's role in the theater, especially that of defer, uh, excuse me, deterring armed conflict and building a network of allies and partners in order to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, for more than 70 years, I would argue that the Indo-Pacific has been largely peaceful and that's due to two things. First is the willingness and commitment of free nations to work together, as well as the credibility of the combat power that's resonant within U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and certainly U.S. Army Forces Pacific and U.S. Forces Korea. But most importantly, the credibility of that combat power as it works alongside its allies and partners in the region. That peace and the resulting prosperity are now threatened by the likes of the People's Republic of China, by Russia, by the Democratic People's, uh, People's Republic of Korea, excuse me, and by violent extremist organizations across the theater. This is in addition to the constant threat of natural disasters to our nations. Living here on the rim of fire, so close to the equator, um, it seems like our mutual natural disaster period is a never-ending 365 days a year. But I believe we are facing a serious threat to all of us, a fundamental divergence in values that leads to two incompatible visions of the future when we speak of the People's Republic of China especially. Through fear and coercion, our adversaries are seeking to bend break and replace the existing rules-based international order. In its place, they seek to create a new international order, one that is closed and authoritarian, one where nations large and small subordinate their own sovereignty 
to the interest of just one country, an outcome that displaces the, the stability and peace of the Indo-Pacific that has endured for some 70 years now. Make no mistake, the job at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command is to lead the military component of America's national strategy to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. First and foremost, that means we will deter escalation to armed conflict. But if deterrence fails, we will be able to dominate any adversary and win in conflict should any adversary choose that path. I'm happy to say there is a general convergence around the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, as Japan, Australia, New Zealand, President Modi's speech, excuse me, Prime Minister Modi's speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue last year, as well as Indonesia's effort to lead a free and open Indo-Pacific concept, the development of one within ASEAN, is critically important. But collectively, our armies face a wide array of threats across the whole of the continuum of competition when it comes to our adversaries. As I mentioned, we collectively face the threat of natural disasters, but we face co coercion and corruption as well. These attempt to prevent the ability of all forces to respond to national threats during times of peace. We also face the persistent threat of terrorism, and of course we face the potential of armed conflict. Indeed, the challenges facing the land forces throughout the theater are forcing an evolution in doctrine, in posture, in training and equipment. And just as the rifle and the tank changed the way the Army fought in the last century, land forces today must adapt to equal, equally significant changes in the environment of the 21st century. And as our threats evolve, we must be able to deter, respond, and again, dominate and win. The Department of Defense and the Army will procure new capabilities, develop new concepts, and enhance our capacity. But we will only be lethal if we have the readiness and ability to employ these alongside our allies and partners. That means we need compatibility, interoperability, and combined training to ensure our interdependence during armed conflict should deterrence fail. And since no two competitors are alike, we cannot attempt to deter one in the same way as another. Any competitor or adversary in our theater must not see an avenue to success through armed conflict. And I have to say that the U.S. Army's actions to date to improve its deterrent posture in theater is commendable. Extending the duration of Pacific Pathways, as just one example, Extending the duration of Pacific Pathways rotations provides Indo-Pacific Command with the capacity to respond to crises quicker than when we are forward deployed than when in our home garrison. But that's just one example. The engagement it provides is exceptional as well. The Army's investment in multi-domain operations capability is also a significant step in the right direction to be able to fight in this 21st century. The Army took a big step forward last year during the rim of the Pacific exercise when it demonstrated its ability to deliver fires against maritime targets. But there is indeed more work to do. We must keep in mind that our competitors have been studying the American way of war and developing asymmetric capabilities to compete with us for more than 20 years. We have not attended to these new threats like we attended to the threats in Southwest Asia so far. We have a long way to go to regain the deterrent advantage we enjoyed as recently as just 25 years ago. The entire Department of Defense will continue to invest in capabilities, the capacities, and the readiness in order to dominate in the air, sea, space, cyberspace, and land domains vis-a-vis -vis peer competitors such as the People's Republic of China or Russia and also will continue to combat the persistent threat of terrorism. One of America's inherent strengths is that it does not act, fight, or win unilaterally. 
As the land component evolves to compete, deter, and win, it must do so in a way that is compatible and interoperable with allies and partners. As I said earlier, our vision is to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific alongside a constellation of like-minded allies and partners. This is an achievable strategic goal if and only if we are willing to work together. As we have for the last 70 years, we will continue to thrive by working together, united by mutual security, by our mutual security concerns, our interests, and our values. It is not lost on the vast majority in the region that America and its allies has fought and bled across the Indo-Pacific not to conquer it, but to liberate it. We respect the sovereignty of all nations and their citizens, large and small, to fly, sail, and operate consistent with the rule of law. The vast majority of nations as well support a rules-based international order that is free from coercion and one that enhances our relative peace and growing prosperity. And we must attend to the values which underwrite the principles of a free and open Indo-Pacific as well. We must reaffirm, promote, and defend collectively our shared values as defined by the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which respect individual rights and liberties while promoting governance accountable to our citizens. Collectively, when we make strategic decisions through the combined lens of security, interests, and values, and we encourage others to do the same, we can ensure a prosperous, a peaceful, and a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, if I could, I just want to live, leave you with three operational level things to think about. These thoughts come in the form of our engagements, our exercises, and our individual experiences. First, the U.S. approach to allies and partners at the operational level is through mutually beneficial and purposeful engagements. We endeavor to be attuned to the needs of our partners and find solutions that benefit both of us. At the heart of it, we intend to build partnerships that build trust. This concept applies in our foreign military sales, in the interoperability that comes from common systems, from common operating norms, and in our formal and in interpersonal relationships. Coming together in venues like LANPAC is most appreciated and helps advance our collective security. Second, when it comes to exercises, we must attend to new concepts and capabilities in cyber and space and in the understanding of the defense of our critical infrastructures, the resilience that's required between the civilian apparatus and the military one. Our intelligence, our maneuver, our fires, and our sustainment concepts, all operational level of war concepts, should be developed alongside other services jointly. And most importantly, they must recognize allied and partner capability and capacity to contribute, either in kind or in conjunction <clears throat> with these and their expertise, and excuse me, and their expert understanding of the local and regional security needs and capabilities. These must likely be accommodated. Lastly, excuse me, these must likewise be accommodated. Lastly, it has been my great fortune to come to meet and know many of you, understand your concerns, your capabilities, the capacity of your militaries. We will have true compatibility and interoperability when we come to truly rely on each other's experience. We in the United States intend to try, learn, and improve while alongside our allies and partners. Land forces have long been a bulwark in this theater and will continue to be so through shared experiences and a commitment to learn from each other. Looking forward, I expect U.S. Army Forces Pacific will continue to play a foundational role in assuring Indo-Pacific nations 
share that experience. We too are in this for the long haul and with that shared experience. Engagements like these, exercises like Cobra Gold and others, and shared experiences will continue to help us work together in peace to prevent conflict and sustain the rules-based international order that has led to the peace and prosperity that all our nations rely upon. As I said earlier, the Indo-Pacific has been largely peaceful due to that willingness and commitment, as well as the credibility of the combat power of all of us working together side by side. Our competitors are threatening our peace by trying, trying to sow doubt in that very premise. I have no doubt about the United States. I have no doubt about our allies and partners represented in this room today. Together, we can and we will continue to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. Once again, I thank U.S. Uh, uh, the Land Pack Symposium, excuse me, um, here in AUSA uh, for the tremendous job they've done putting together this forum. I appreciate all of your attention today and wish you the, the best of the remainder of your week. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Abel Davidson, and thanks. Uh, we, we know you have just a few things on your plate, so it's not lost on us that, uh, that it, you found it sufficiently important to, to be here. Your reminder of the evidence on partnerships and, and relationships uh, rings true and consistent with what we have heard from the other senior commanders uh, throughout this conference. Um, and I think your, your very clear call to all of the armies of the region uh, to adapt to the rapidly changing the Indo-Pacific uh, environment is very clear. We should all remember for the, on the U.S. side, you know, and the challenges clearly delineated in the National Defense Strategy. Four of the five challenges are resident in this theater and only in this theater. China, Russia, North Korea, uh, and certainly the continuing challenge of violent extremist organizations. But similarly, the priorities that are identified in the National Defense Strategy of an unrelenting commitment to readiness uh, is evident here in the Pacific Theater. Uh, a continuing uh, commitment to allies and partners, the ironclad alliance that General Abrams spoke of, also evident here. And uh, Admiral, your presence here today, uh, for all of the armies and for all of us here today, uh, certainly communicates your very clear understanding and commitment to the essential role of land forces in the Pacific Thank you, sir, for your time and for your continued support. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, please. Okay, we turn now to our, our afternoon panel here at, at day two. Uh, and we, 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 the, the next panel, if I can invite uh, uh, Joan Dickinson and, and Joan Crutchfield, if you'd bring your panel up. Uh, this afternoon's panel wins the award for longest title, all right? Executing the operational elements of air and missile defense through the integration of offensive and defensive fires in support of multi-domain operations. All right, you'll be quizzed on this at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the panel. We are honored today that uh, uh, the, the panel chair for today is Lieutenant General Jim Dickinson. Commanding General United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command, and also the Commander of Army Forces Strategic Command. And we're welcome back to the Pacific, our moderator, Lieutenant General Retired Tony Crutchfield, uh, Vice President, Army Systems, Defense, Space, and Security, uh, Government Operations at the Boeing Company, and a former Deputy Commander at United States Pacific Command. General Crutchfield, General Dickinson, off to you. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for this afternoon's panel, please. Thank you, uh, and aloha. It's aloha. good to, uh, wow, that was a big rousing aloha. It's good to be, always good to be back uh, uh, in the Pacific, seeing a lot of uh, friends and, uh, and thinking about the challenges, uh, some of which never change. Uh, I, I will not, uh, General Ham. I will not repeat the uh, title of the uh, panel today. You've done a great job. I'll skip that. 
I'd like to uh, formally introduce our panel members today, and then after brief comments uh, from them, uh, we'll, we'll move into our question and answer period. As uh, General uh, Ham said, uh, our panel chair today, uh, to my right, is Lieutenant General Jim Dixon, Commander of the United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, and the Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense. Also, Major General Doug Gabram, the Director of Test Missile Defense Activity. Major General Mike Morsey, Commander 94th Ar uh, Army Air and Missile Defense Command. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, don't, hey, the, the, I don't know anything more than you do, Mike, sorry. Thanks, sir. Uh, Colonel Monty Montauk, Commander 5th uh, BCD, and also Colonel Mark, Mark Holler, the Commandant of the United States Army Air uh, Defense Artillery School and the Chief of the Air Defense Artillery Branch. What I'd like to do at this time is turn it over to General Dixon. All right, thank you, Tony, and uh, good afternoon. Aloha. Hello. Uh, so if Admiral Davidson was still here, I was going to do Go Army, Beat Navy, <laughs> and I could have continued that through the whole panel. But, uh, but uh, anyway, it's great to be here. Uh, General Ham, uh, thanks for having us again and inviting me back here. You know, it's always a, a great invitation, uh, along with General Brown asking us to come out here from uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and my next-door neighbor is, is with me today. So uh, better to be in Hawaii today uh, with this beautiful weather and beautiful scenery rather than in Huntsville, where I think it's pretty hot and humid right now. <laughs> But uh, great to be back here again uh, today for this panel. And, uh, and again, uh, to Tony, thanks for uh, again uh, helping me out with the, the panel today. I think it'll be a, a good one. And I wanted to touch just uh, quickly, I know Tony went through uh, the folks on the panel, but I want to kind of set the stage in terms of the uh, expertise that we have up on the, on the panel today. And I'll, I'll just kind of look down the panel and go, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, Pacific experience here on the panel today. So my personal experience is I've been in the Indo-PACOM region for about four years serving on and off, uh, come back from time to time. But as you look down the, uh, the table here, you'll see that we've got uh, Mike Morrissey, uh, a true air defender, has been, been here for a little while here in the command of the 94th. And then down at the end of the table is uh, Mark Holler, who uh, just recently, not too, too long ago, came out of uh, Korea as the 35th 88 Brigade commander and really can, uh, a lot of the uh, additives to the pen peninsula in terms of capability happened during Mark's uh, watch over there. And then, of course, we've got uh, a couple other folks that I'll mention here in a minute. But what I want to kind of build to is that uh, although we may have Mark Holler here in an institutional role, he's got a lot of operational warfighting experience. Just as the person to my right, which is uh, Major General Doug Gabram, uh, most of you may know that he is an expert aviator in our Army today. Uh, was last the AMCOM commander not too long ago, who did a lot of great things for our aviation as well as our missile defense forces around the world, but is now the director for tests for the Missile Defense Agency. And so uh, I will tell you, having an aviator come in to, uh, to run our uh, MDA tests that I'll talk about in just a minute is, is a big win for us because it brings an absolute operational experience to that particular enterprise and that, uh, that job. And of course, we've got uh, Monty Montague down there as the uh, uh, 5th BCD commander. Uh, and as you notice on the, uh, the title of the slide, we're talking about offensive and defensive fires integration. So on this panel, we've got uh, folks that, uh, one, they're sitting on this panel, and two, do it every day between uh, uh, Monty and uh, Mike Morrissey. So I think we've got a pretty good bench here. And the reason I bring all that up is just to make sure all the hard questions will go to those individuals today uh, here on the panel. But, uh, but again, it's great to be here today, uh, and we're going to talk, I'm going to talk for a few minutes here about some missile defense broad concepts and strategies. The good news is we have had a tremendous amount of documents, guidance that's come out over the past couple of years from the NSS to the NDS to the Army vision to the Army strategy, and most recently we've had the missile defense review that has been uh, finalized, approved, and is on the street and is being actioned as we speak in terms of some tasks that came out in the Missile Defense Review that are very important for uh, not only the Missile Defense Enterprise, but our uh, DOD Global Forces in particular, and I think Doug Gabriel will probably touch a couple of times on the MDR. So what I'd like to do, you know, I sat through the uh, panel with uh, uh, my, my friend uh, Mike Bills, and uh, I think the title of theirs was, if I wrote it down right, Black Swans and Pink Flamingos, uh, preparing for a 
unknowable future while avoiding a knockout blow. And so when I heard that and saw that and listened to the remarks, I almost thought, boy, that'd be a good title for this, this particular panel. Because that's what we do, quite frankly, every day is we figure out how we are going to avoid that knockout blow from a missile threat. And then we're also trying to do what? Modernize and get better each and every day so that we're ready for that unknowable future. So, uh, you know, I wish I could have stolen that and changed my, my ch chart before this, but I'm, now I'm stuck with what I've got. But I thought that was a very good panel, Mike. Appreciate you doing that today. So if I could go to the first slide. So I got three charts that you'll have to bear with me on, but this particular chart I show in many different forums. And the reason I showed this chart is I just want to talk for a minute about what our, uh, what our comprehensive approach to missile defense, in my mind, it should be. And that is one where you, if you look at this chart in particular, if you kind of look across on the lower right-hand side and then kind of up to the middle of that chart, you see a lot of things, right? You see a lot of weapon systems. You see a lot of capabilities that are on that chart. Everything from THAAD to Patriot to Aegis, whether it's BMD or whether it's Aegis Ashore. And you see the interceptors. You've seen the ground-based mid-course defense system that we've got soldiers at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and Colorado manning each and every day 24-7, 365 in defense of our homeland. And so when you look to the kind of the center of that chart to the right, you see a lot of things, a lot of capabilities. What you also see, if you look at down to the, towards the bottom, you see that green arrow there. And of course, that's a very, very precise uh, dollar sign that's put on there. But it's three dollar signs, which means we spend a lot of money and a lot of uh, investments in that particular part of a ballistic missile trajectory. So if you kind of look, I didn't, fa I failed to mention that if you kind of look to that chart, you look all the way to the left, you'll see that missile flying its uh, ballistic missile trajectory to the right-hand side of that chart. And so once you get up to the middle of that chart, you see what? You see you've got a lot of capabilities that defeat that threat from the mid-course to what we call the terminal phase of flight, which is the very right-hand side of that chart. That's very expensive. We're able to do that, and we've invested a lot in it. But I think we can all agree that with the growing operational environment, we will have probably more missiles than we have interceptors. So how do we get after balancing that calculus? I would propose to you that we balance that calculus by looking to the left-hand side of that chart, where, where you don't really see a lot of things, right? You don't see a lot of kinetic type of capabilities where we can get after our uh, adversary missile launches from a different perspective. One where we look to more of a left of launch or a prior to launch type of capability, or during the, uh, the ascent phase or the boost phase of that uh, interceptor. The threat bar along the bottom, the blue, and then it merges into red there as you go to the left, kind of shows you where vulnerabilities exist. So it's, it's no surprise that when a, when a, when a uh, ballistic missile launches, its most vulnerable point is while it's still sitting on the ground or very early in the launch, where it is attaining altitude, speed, direction, et cetera, and that is where it's the most vulnerable. So we, we should look from a holistic missile defense perspective at trying to defeat that in that particular uh, course of the flight. Uh, and while it's expensive on the right-hand side of that chart, as I show with that green arrow, it's a little less expensive when you look to the left-hand side of that. Whether that is through kinetic or non-kinetic means, you know, our ability to reverse what we call the, the cost curve uh, or reverse that so that we have a capability that's, that's able to defeat it that's less expensive than the missile itself that we're trying to defeat. And we don't necessarily have that today. So we have seen where quadcopters that have been used against us in certain parts of the world uh, have been defeated with a Patriot missile. And that's an excellent example of the wrong side of the cost curve that we might be on in that particular event, having to use a Patriot multi-million dollar uh, missile against a $250 quadcopter that you can buy at Amazon.com. So the ability to reverse that cost curve rests in our ability to look at that left-hand side of that chart, if you will, and put our investments and our uh, capability development in, into that. Because it's really, if you look at it, it's almost pennies on the dollar when you look at that capability being matured and fielded as opposed to the right-hand side. Slide, please. So the next chart I'll, I'll show you there is, so I know we had uh, very eloquently put yesterday from Eric Wesley, and I've heard him do it several times, talking about multi-domain operations. Uh, I'm not going to go through this chart in detail other than suffice it to say to look at the thing that is joining those two bubbles, if you will, together. 
and all of us in here can probably recognize the fact that that is a what? A satellite. And so what I want to talk about a little bit on that is the fact that, you know, our ability to operate in a, in a theater that uh, is termed, you know, where we are fighting the tyranny of distance in many respects is very dependent upon our ability to operate from space using space assets. And those space base capabilities are so important to what we do each and every day from communications to missile warning to uh, friendly force tracking to intelligence gathering. And as we look to the future and as we've seen uh, that is that in the open news these days in terms of what the Space Force, the space, uh, U.S. Spacecom and those types of uh, organizations are looking at for the future, our ability to leverage space will, is more important and is growing each and every day. You know, if you look across, and I see uh, General Clark sitting out there, you know, if you look at one of your brigade combat teams right now, you know, it's anywhere from what, about 4,000 to 4,500 super troopers that, uh, that are trained warriors and soldiers. But in that formation, there's more than 2,500 pieces of space-enabled equipment that relies upon space in order to function and win on the battlefield today. There's more than 250 satellite communications-based assets that are within that formation, and that's a single BCT. You know, it's no, it, it's no mystery that the U.S. Army is the biggest consumer of space capabilities in the de Department of Defense today. So our ability to recognize that, our ability to train in a denied, degraded, and uh, disrupted environment from space is very important so that our soldiers understand that. But more importantly, we understand how to leverage space in the pursuit of ground combat operations. Slide, please. So if you take the backdrop of that first chart that I had that showed the ballistic missile flight and where we were on the cost curve, you took the last chart that I showed in terms of obviously multi-domain operations, we kind of get back to how do we, how do we get after the missile, missile uh, problem is set within each of our op plans in the Indo-Pacific. And one of the ways is to, uh, to employ the operational AMD elements. And so this is not new. This has been around since I was about a captain in the United States Army in, in terms of what are the pillars of air and missile defense. And you can see them across there. It's quite, quite evident. It, one is active defense, passive defense, attack operations, and mission command. All of those, if you look at the definitions up there in those four quadrants, fall nice and neatly within our multi-domain formations and operations that we are developing today. And so the first one I'll talk about is active defense. I, I spoke about that two charts ago, and that, that is being able to have the capability to defeat an adversary missile threat. Passive operations, passive defense, is something in, in the, I know in the U.S. Army that we have gotten away from over the years. And passive defense is, uh, is as simple as things such as dispersion, camouflage, uh, not uh, making sure that you're not visible to, the, uh, to our adversaries from, uh, from an overhead position. It's also having the capability on the ground to warn our forces of an incoming missile attack. It's planning for hardening infrastructures, those types of things, so that we're not an easy target, if you will, because the fact of the matter is you'll never have enough active defense in order to protect every asset that you would like to. So how do you mitigate that? You mitigate that through doing what you can in terms of passive defense. Attack operations, so we'll talk a little bit more about this on the panel, but the ability to strike whatever fired at you on the battlefield is very important. So your ability to counter-strike, or in some cases actually uh, negate that threat before it even launches is very, very important. But our ability to integrate offensive and defensive fires in a manner in which you can effectively and timely negate that uh, missile threat before it ever launches is part of that attack operations. Because what we need to do is change the calculus of many different missiles that are able to target us to fewer missiles and those fewer missiles, now we have a better probability or calculus of defeating them with missiles that we particularly have in our inventory or within our partner capacity uh, inventory as well. So with that, uh, I'll pause and turn it over to uh, my esteemed colleague, Major General Doug Gabram, the uh, Director for Tests for the Missile Defense Agency. Over to you, hey, sir. Doug. Thanks. And it's just, it's great to see um, old bosses, mentors, and friends, and General Bills, great, great panel. General Thurman, 
it's always good to see you. We appreciate your guidance and mentorship. And, and I'm going to say this because the I'll probably get reported, but the chief and the vice aren't here, so I'm going to say, "Go tribe." General Ham and I, we share the same passion uh, for the Cleveland Indians. Um, hey, so th the so rules for this there. panel were you were not supposed to be plugging that stuff. Yes, sir. And <laughs> so they actually took a vote to let the aviator, the operational aviator, be part of the panel, and somehow. <laughs> I got on here, and then General Dickinson said, uh, "Sir, you, you're Doug, you, you can't be loose in the secondary, so you got to have some some written down points." And I, so, sir, I do, and, and I'll try to be uh, try to be brief. So, I've been in the job about 90 days as the director for test, and I've definitely seen the importance um, and the relevancy of this topic, and understand, um, frankly, the regional and homeland ballistic missile defense is a complex joint team sport and I guess that's my bottom line joint team sport and if you haven't had a chance to see the um, missile defense review um, it came out in January signed by the SECDEF it's really worth reading um, a lot of a great details emphasis on the importance of our regional and homeland uh, ballistic missile defense so I highly recommend that um, and I I have one slide here today and you can see if you go it's the same slide General Dickinson showed and why is that is because we're a nested um, we have the same layered BMDS and as MDA is an integral part in the development testing and fielding of most of the weapon systems you see on this slide and the number one purpose for all of it is is the warfighter and as you listen to General Abrams this morning and General Bills' comments about the importance and the power and the strength of the alliance, 65 plus years with the rock, ironclad, you know, built on sacrifice values and commitment, it's uh, incredibly powerful. And as Admiral Davidson talked about, 28 nations, um, the magnitude of the Indo-Pacific Command is, is incredible, not only in the physical breadth, but the operational complexity and the importance to global security. Also, and I wrote it down, um, Lieutenant General Chun's comment, we don't go to war with North Korea without the U.S. Without the U.S., we can't survive. So my big takeaway, and you can't say it enough, ironclad. Um, so let me, let me just start with the potential threat and adversaries and the near peer competitors. I think that leads to General Davidson's five key challenges that threaten a fair and open, a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, number one of those five is North Korea, China, and Russia. And we understand that North Korea remains the most immediate challenge, and MDA remains lockstep with the USFK and Indo-PACOM on their near-term priorities of countering North Korean missile threats. Our MDA director, um, Lieutenant General Greaves, a few weeks ago, um, testified and relayed his confidence in the ground-based mid-course defense system to defend the homeland against North Korean missile system, and that's inclusive of Hawaii. To highlight this, um, we just demonstrated in March the reliability and capability of the system with a major flight test called FTG-11, where we successfully intercepted a complex ICBM launched from Quaj, the first coupled with the first salvo launch of two ground-based interceptors from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And the scope and the assets involved in this were, frankly, historic. Multiple services, General Dickens' team, SMDC, involved space asset, assets, F-35s, UAS, radars from Alaska, Guam, Wake Island, Hawaii, multiple Navy ships, command and control from Colorado Springs to Vandenberg, all the way here to Hawaii it was incredible to be part of. And frankly, I wish I had the time to show you the video. But the GBI lead interceptor destroyed the reentry vehicle in an exo-atmospheric engagement to knuckle draggers like myself. That means in space, really high, about 4,000 <laughs> miles over the Pacific. And then the trail GBI launched, looked at the resulting debris, remaining objects, selected the most lethal object, just like it was designed to do, and hit it. 
So for the crews, the war fighters of the 6th, 613th AOC right here in Hawaii, the 100th GMD Brigade in Colorado Springs who participated in the test, it validated the trust. And really it's an overall big win for our nation and to include many industry partners here in the room. Another challenge Admiral Davison talked about is China's aggressive weapons modernization efforts and represents, frankly, I think the greatest long-term strategic threat to the Indo-Pacific region and the United States. So China, as we know, has fielded, can field, or it's close to fielding, hypersonic delivery systems that could hold our carrier battle groups or our four deployed forces on land at risk. The Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Secretary Griffin, testified before the SASC Emerging Threats Subcommittee a couple weeks ago. He said this, speed of delivery of new capability to the field is what really matters. DOD has innovators, but no more time. While the U.S. enjoyed the peace dividend, China copied the U.S. Superbook playbook, and Russia is now reassurgent. So speaking of Russia, we also acknowledge Russia's recently announced plans to reinforce the Pacific Fleet with maneuver and has maneuverable hypersonic glide vehicle and an air launch ballistic missile. So addressing these advanced threats remains one of MDA's highest priorities, but we got to do this as part of a joint team and stay ahead of the evolving threats. My last point is to emphasize this is we just conducted, we hosted a joint BMDS futures war game exercise in April with all the combatant commands, STRATCOM, policy reps from OSD, and the joint staff, and PACOM was obviously a primary player. And personally, I left wide, my eyes wide open in this exercise, and I took four key takeaways. First, we need to be able to detect, track, and discriminate globally. We can't populate the Earth with sufficient radars and sensors. That capability will likely be a space-based sensor network. Number two, we need the ability to defeat the threat before launch or to defeat threat missiles in the boost and ascent phases, as General Dickinson mentioned. Third, we'll need a more advanced defeat capability, whether that be modifications to the existing interceptors that we have, a new interceptor, or directed energy. Fourth and finally, we'll have to be sure our battle management systems are up to the challenge of focusing on complex and rapidly changing data to enable timely engagement decisions because time is our biggest enemy. And cross-command coordination isn't optional, it's mandatory. As you look at this chart, and frankly, as General Dickinson stated, we need to understand the missile defense, particularly when conducted in the mid-course and terminal phases of flight, it's extremely expensive. We need to flip or we need to work the cost curve, and there are a few ways to do that. Cost effectiveness, is fielding the right balance between numbers of interceptors and our discrimination capabilities. We all understand that a good defense relies on a strong offense, especially if you're a Golden State Warrior fan, but attack operations will become increasingly important as threats become more complex. We can't shoot ourselves or shoot our way out of this fight. We must enhance our discrimination capabilities to identify the most lethal threats so we can effectively and quickly shoot, assess, shoot, and keep our interceptor inventory relevant and reliable, but affordable. So in closing, the, we've talked about the threats. They're extremely complex. I would highly recommend that you look at the missile defense review. It's very informative. And my big takeaway is ballistic missile defense is a joint team sport. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. That was a good uh, Sorry about the segue handoff. into attack operations. We'll go ahead and go to the next uh, chart. So as uh, already mentioned, attack operations have been an operational element uh, of air defense uh, doctrine for, for quite some time. You can go all the way back to, to Desert Storm. The joint forces have spent um, considerable time and effort uh, attempting to locate and target uh, you know, enemy uh, surface-to-surface -surface missile threat. Uh, in my own operational experience as a captain in the mid-1990s, 1st Battlefield Coordination Detachment, uh, that was my primary uh, role and function, uh, to plan and execute 
uh, both deliberate and dynamic uh, targeting against uh, threat missile systems. And I'll tell you what we found is that it's a highly, it was a highly resource intensive uh, operation uh, with very little return uh, on that high investment. So that was really proven true in uh, the two conflicts uh, in Iraq and all the training exercises in between those two conflicts. So in response, as, as we've already kind of talked about here, a, a heavy investment went into our de defensive, our active defense uh, capabilities. So we modernized Patriot uh, into a very credible ballistic missile defense uh, capability. Uh, we developed and fielded uh, THAAD and then also uh, the ground-based mid-course defense uh, system for the homeland defense that we talked about. So moving forward, uh, it, was, it was mentioned earlier that uh, early this year, uh, the President and the Acting Secretary of Defense, uh, Shanahan, uh, came to the, uh, were at the Pentagon, and in a televised event, they rolled out the 2019 Missile Defense Review. And really, the, um, what I'll be talking about is a, a renewed emphasis uh, in this defense review uh, on attack operations um, moving forward. So as part of a, a comprehensive uh, missile defense strategy, attack operations uh, will degrade, disrupt, or destroy uh, threat missiles left of launch. So and really the outcome that we're looking for here uh, with attack operations is more effective active defense. And as mentioned earlier, the less uh, targets that you have to intercept, um, you know, the, the better your active defense fight is going to go. Uh, it's important to note that attack operations is not uh, going to supersede uh, active defense operations. They're going to uh, fuse those or work together as part of that comprehensive approach uh, that we talked about. So you might ask, why do we have the renewed emphasis? We've tried it in the past. Uh, we weren't very successful for what, what's, the, what's the reason for this renewed emphasis on attack operations for missile defense. And it was already kind of been discussed here in the panel already. Number one is the changing nature of the threat, and number two is the cost uh, to, to meet that challenge of that new uh, threat. And it was talked about a lot yesterday, you know, our, our enemy has developed that multi-layered standoff A2AD capability, and, and uh, their surface-to-surface -surface missile systems are a big part of that uh, anti-area access uh, area denial capability. So the bottom line is, is the reason for the new, the, the new emphasis is our, uh, our access to theater, our ability to set the theater uh, is in jeopardy. Uh, so what is, the, what is the path forward? And that's kind of what uh, is highlighted there on the chart, what it depicts. So it's, it's the Office of Fire's concept, uh, and it's going to provide the theater commander with land-based strategic attack uh, options to deal uh, with that A2AD threat. There's really three critical components uh, in this concept. Number one is an integrated uh, ISR uh, network that allow us to observe and acquire uh, threat missile systems and their supporting networks. So some of the characteristics of that uh, network include, as I already mentioned, uh, a lot of it or some of it will be space-based uh, sensors for that persistent uh, overhead coverage. Uh, it will include joint interagency and multinational uh, sensors. So that's uh, a big part of the uh, interoperability piece with our, our partners and allies. They need to be part of the solution uh, for the sensor uh, piece, for sure. Uh, some of the sensors are going to be rocket delivered, and that's going to provide uh, what, I, what I would call dynamic sensing in support of dynamic targeting. Um, these sensors are going to be able to talk to each other, so they'll be able to pass data uh, back and forth to each other, uh, and that's going to help with queuing uh, as as well as uh, the target correlation uh, purposes. So the second component is the, the command and control capability. And that, that's going to be designed to match sensors to targets and targets to shooters. And at speed is described by Lieutenant General Wesley yesterday uh, during the MDO uh, panel. So some characteristics of this capability. Um, it'll be able to take sensor data from multiple types and numbers of sensors. It'll fuse that data into a, a um, target um, solution. It'll facilitate airspace deconfliction. That was something that, uh, that really uh, was part of our lack of success in the past is the length of time that that 
uh, that took, which is the airspace deconfliction, and then it'll assign the appropriate shooter uh, to service the target. And then the last thing is the shooter, uh, third component, and that's, uh, that's going to be a number of shooters that can range targets within both the, the strategic deep fires area and the operational deep fires area. So how are we going to get there? Well, the Army is accelerating uh, the development of these capabilities, um, and it's being spearheaded by the Army Futures Command. And then I'll, I'll just conclude by um, sharing something that uh, Lieutenant General Lundy, he's the CAC commander, um, reminds us often when he speaks to us. He says that uh, in our history, uh, we have often lost the first uh, battle uh, in our wars with peer competitors. And that's true here in the Indo-Pacific region, World War II uh, and Korea. Uh, and the result of losing these first battles was having to fight a long protracted uh, war at great cost and sacrifice uh, to gain ultimate victory. So I would submit that uh, we cannot afford to lose the, uh, the next first battle in the near peer conflict. And that strategic offensive strike capability will be critical in doing really three things, deterring our adversaries, um, ensuring that we have access to theater, and then winning the missile defense fight in the first battle should uh, deterrence fail. And uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Brigadier General Morrissey, sir, for your comments. General Ham, first, uh, thank you for putting this on. And, and a great event, um, and duty first, sir. Uh, General Crutchfield, I um, appreciate the promotion earlier, but there's yeah. far too many witnesses in here that know that that, that will never happen. <laughs> Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Aloha. I'm Mike Morsey, the commander of the 94th Army Air and Missile Defense Command. Uh, we're a forward deployed headquarters integrated into the Indo PACOM team. We are organized joint. I'm assigned to USERPAC as one of General Army Brown's Theater Enabling Commands, and we are direct support to PAC AV, General Air Force Brown where I serve as his Deputy Air to Area Defense Commander. I share this because we're in a unique position to be part of an active defense and attack operations all joint, all dedicated to supporting the free Indo-Pacific. We work aggressively to synchronize across air, land, sea, and space domains to integrate our systems into the active defense process of the joint kill chain in a complex environment that was already described over the, really the last two days. So Admiral Davidson talked about the threat earlier, but let me address, really stress a few of those specific to air and missile defense. Our adversaries possess sophisticated capabilities and the world's fastest developing missile and space programs, making the region the most capable air defense, air and missile defense threat environment in the world. The threats we face are growing as well as the capabilities to defeat our systems. General Graber mentioned hypersonic, hypersonics, cruise missiles, unmanned aerial vehicles, and of course a wide array of tactical ballistic missiles. Future challenges in the region include space denial, cyber, precision strike, low-cost GPS, and maneuverable reentry vehicles. This complex network of anti-access aerodenial capability challenges and limits our options. It requires a joint, multi-domain, multilateral response. In this environment, our organization, the 94th, provides and synchronizes combined theater and air and missile defense in order to meet operational requirements and help to deter those threats. Next slide, please. Directing your attention to the chart behind me, let me briefly highlight our presence across Indo-PACOM. We have four deployed sensors that provide detection and discrimination in support of both homeland defense and regional defense. In support of regional active defense, we have four deployed sensors and shooters in Korea, Patriot in Japan, as well as THAAD in Guam. These systems are integrated into our joint kill chain and are tied at echelon with our partners. The activation of the 38th Brigade in Japan last fall has been a force multiplier for the region and is just really one example that demonstrates our commitment to that key ally. Here in Hawaii, our headquarters is integrated in PACAV's Air Operations Center, the 613th. And this is really where we tie it all together in order to synchronize active defense and for Air Force speak, defensive counter air efforts and conduct attack operations planning. User, using user PAC's lines of efforts, readiness, allies and partners, 
and dynamic forward posture as a framework, let me just briefly highlight a few of the integrated air missile defense initiatives that are going on in theater and support integration of offensive and defensive fires. Readiness is number one. Given the threats we face in this contested space of hyper-competition, we must be postured to fight tonight. Everything we do contributes to maintaining that posture. And these readiness exercises we do are tactical up through strategic. In support of the multi-domain task force, we've made significant gains over the last year regarding integrated air missile defense. We've developed and validated engagement kill chains from sensor to shooter, refined mission command, sustainment, task organization within the MDTF. And we continue to work these in upcoming exercises. We also support Army modernization efforts, as well as optimizing the current systems we have, like the integration of THAAD and Patriot. And of course, we stay engaged with the, with the institution, material developer, and, and industry. Lieutenant General Bills mentioned earlier on his panel, we go together. We will not fight without our allies and partners. The combination of geography and sophisticated threats require proactive defense arrangements. It requires us working together with our allies and partners. And our allies have made significant investments in air missile defense. Army Patriot, Navy, Navy Aegis BMD. And we look forward to interoperability as their, uh, their capabilities grow. We continue to strengthen relationships through operational exercises and training rehearsals, all of which strengthen our bond and improve interoperability. We continue to improve joint and combined processes through SME exchanges and tabletop exercises. Lots of work to do, but incredible progress. Finally, through exercises like Defender Pacific and Orient Shield, we support USERPAC's dynamic forward posture line of effort to train agility and responsiveness, which includes conducting CONUS-based deployments. And these and other deployment exercises help ensure we're postured for contingencies, presenting multiple dilemmas, and ultimately contributing to deter deterrence. And our leaders, soldiers across the theater are making great strides every day as we work with our allies and partners to collectively set conditions to strengthen relationships. And I think with that, I'll, I'll stop and pass it over to Colonel Montague. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to start, sir. Thank you, uh, General Ham, for uh, hosting uh, this event. Uh, General Dickinson, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, speak and participate in this panel. As I look across the audience, I think most of you fall into the category where you're passionate and interested about this topic, uh, and you're probably wondering what's an artillery guy doing on a panel talking uh, missile defense. As I also look across the audience, I see a small contingent of folks, many of whom are from my very unit, are just wondering if I can keep my comments under seven minutes. So for those of you in that first group, I hope to convince you by the end of this that, uh, that there is a reason for the Battlefield Coordination Detachment Commander to participate in this forum. And for those in that second group, there's a clock right here, so I promise I will keep my comments to the appropriate length and leave plenty of time for your questions. Uh, in order to give an understanding of, of the perspective that I bring, I would like to talk a little bit about the organization, the 5th Battlefield Coordination Detachment. Now, there are four active duty Battlefield Coordination Detachments. Uh, the one here in Hawaii, the 5th, is uh, 71 soldiers strong. And uh, with that contingent uh, between here on island and those who are spread out on two-person teams across the Pacific, we really have two responsibilities that we provide to General Brown or to other ground force commanders in exercise and in operations. Uh, the first, first and foremost, we have the responsibility for liaison, both with the CFAC as well as with PACAF. And secondly, we have the responsibility for ensuring interoperability and training at those subordinate wings and operations groups across the theater. And what that, uh, what that does is it means that folks in our organization spend a lot of time thinking about planning. Uh, and planning is not sexy. Uh, planning is not what people want to talk about as it relates to interoperability and how we're able to function uh, collaboratively. But planning is absolutely what we have to become more proficient at in the environment uh, that was described yesterday. The fight in the Pacific, uh, as we talked yesterday, is going to be fluid, it's going to be dynamic, and it's going to be fast. And if we're not able to plan across all of our services, then we can't do uh, the most important thing, which is to bring those exquisite serv service-provided capabilities to the fight at the right place and at the right time. 
Uh, the reason why I think that I've given, been given the opportunity to participate in this panel is the best example of what happens when we do that well is how well we do that in the field of ballistic missile defense. How well we're able to synergize Army, Air Force, and Navy capabilities to get after the ballistic missile threat here in the Pacific. But for that future fight against a near-peer competitor, we're going to have to be able to do that across all of our other avenues, whether it has to relate to offensive fires, whether it speaks to defensive fires, we have to do that. Uh, we talked a lot yesterday about the competition phase. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we talked a lot yesterday about the competition phase, and one of the critical characteristics of that competition phase, as defined by General Valesky, was the fact that there are rapid transitions and you don't have the time to establish capability if it's not already present, uh, either in the form of boots on the ground or in the form of capability that you can leverage immediately in support of the fight. But those capabilities, having the capability is not enough if you're not able to do the requisite planning that's required to integrate that capability. Uh, and that's what, in our organization, we spend a lot of time doing. We are positioned in the PACAF headquarters in the 613th Air Operations Center to do just that. And we provide really five critical capabilities to the ground component commander. Uh, we, are the, we are his liaison to ensure the integration of Air Force strike capability in support of land operations. We do the same thing as it relates to ISR uh, re responsibilities and requirements, providing uh, links into the Air Force assets that provide that capability. Uh, we do the same thing when it comes to airspace, helping the ground force commander understand, manage, and leverage the airspace in order to execute uh, ground operations. We also, uh, in the Pacific, we all know that the fights here are always away games. There's an airlift component that's required in order to execute that effectively, whether it's the movement of materiel, of personnel, or of critical equipment uh, to the right place and at the right time. And lastly, we are uh, the link for the ground force commander to provide targeting capability into the uh, Air Force targeting system inside of the Air Operations Center. And all of these capabilities, when the Battlefield Coordination det Detachments were originally established, it was really about ensuring that the Ground Force Commander's equities were met, providing Air Force assets predominantly in support of the Ground Force Commander. But the fight in the 21st century has moved to a point where we are just as likely to be the supporting commander as we are to be the supported commander. But in order to do that, in order for that to be a reality, we have to have the requisite expertise in all of the planning processes across the joint force in order to be able to bring those unique ground capabilities to bear in leverage either in support of other components or aiding those other components in support of us. And our organization has the responsibility to do that. Uh, I would tell you, again, uh, wanting to leave in the maximum amount of time for questions, I would leave you with uh, three takeaways. If you want to understand the importance of planning, uh, particularly in a joint environment, uh, effective planning is really the difference between deconfliction, which is the bare minimum requirement, synchronization, which is high school to college level, and synergy, which is graduate level, which is the expectation that we have to have if, uh, as Colonel Holler talked about, we're going to win that first battle. We have to be able to synergize all of those capabilities by putting the right experts in the right place uh, in order to do that. Uh, secondly, uh, as I mentioned before, the competition phase is all about managing transitions. The more effectively that you plan, the more capable you are in operation to adjust to changes, it's particularly changes that are dynamic in nature. Uh, I hear a lot of ground com commanders express frustration with the, the ATO, with the air tasking order, and the rigidity that comes uh, with that process as it's perceived. However, the more time and energy that we put into developing that plan, the more flexibility we have in execution. And lastly, I would make the humble argument that the Battlefield Coordination Detachment is the epicenter for that opportunity to plan effectively and collaboratively across the joint force. We are positioned in the Air Operations Center uh, and with the right subject matter experts in terms of lethal, non-lethal fires, intelligence support, airspace and airlift management, uh, we have the ability to, to not be the choke point, but to be the conduit for Army capabilities in support of the Joint Force. Thank you all for your time. All right, thanks uh, to all the panel members. Uh, now we'd like to jump into the questions. We've got a few. 
I'll start out uh, with the first question to uh, General Dickinson. Sir, deconflicting targets and engagement assets among services and allies and partners requires a common operating picture and a common communications network. To what degree does such commonality exist right now? So that's a great question. Um, I will tell you that the, it exists today uh, in, 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 in the Indo-Pacific uh, theater, uh, but to the extent to which it exists, it needs to get better. And I would say that uh, with what we see in new capabilities and capacity that's being built, uh, not only by the U.S., but our allies and partners, and as we, we look to the future and we look to these new capabilities, we've always got to make sure that we're looking to a capability that is interoperable, meaning we're able to share data, uh, but getting to the point where we're integrated, where we're able to take that data amongst the different systems and be able to actually action an engagement or an action based upon that. So interoperable to integrated, and then we really need to get to where we have the best shooter and the best sensors that are available to in, in order to mitigate a threat. So today it exists, but not to the level I think that we need to have uh, in the future. Thank you. The next question is uh, for General Gabram. Sir, what are MDA's testing events that will affect Indo-PACOM in the near future? So, not not a complete memorization, but there's there's probably um, four events that that are going to affect Indo-PACOM in the next. I'll, I'll just summarize in, in six months. Um, the first, and we have some kind of numbers in the way we categorize events, um, not only on the ground test, but and people forget about the ground test aspect before the flight test, because the ground test sets the conditions in terms of modeling, simulation, criteria, data, et cetera. Um, so every, when you, when you see or hear about a flight test, there's ground testing left of that that's extremely important. So FTM 31, um, it's called, is at the um, end of July, and that is going to be an Aegis uh, shot against a specified target. Um, there's also what we call FTT 23, um, that's going to be a test uh, in the August time frame um, to validate the remote um, THAAD um, launcher capability, um, to validate a, uh, the latest hardware, or I'm sorry, software upgrade. Um, there'll also be um, a test uh, in September um, that will that'll be involve Patriot remote link to the TIPI-2 radar for the THAAD. And then uh, there'll be a test in uh, the November time frame, um, which will involve a multi-service um, uh, element that'll, that'll look at uh, various aspects of the hypersonic threat. Thank you. Our next question is for General Morsi. Sir, can you explain how the 94th AAMDC is supporting USERPAC's dynamic forward posture? Yes, sir. So. The purpose, let me back up. The purpose of the dynamic forward posture is really for to train agility and responsiveness throughout the theater. So a few ways the 94th is doing that, and the support of the maneuver force up front. Uh, we're doing low-cost initiatives such as crew immersion, deploying crews from stateside to theater, uh, falling in on equipment theater in theater to train and uh, get immersed in theater TTPs. Uh, we're supporting Orient Shield later this year in terms of using in the in theater Patriot to deploy to islands we have not been to before, so we'll learn from that in terms of reconnaissance. Um, again, in support of the maneuver force. And then in support, support of Defender Pacific 20, deploying CONUS-based air and missile defense forces um, to an island chain to exercise, uh, provide protection again for the maneuver force. Thank you, sir. Our next question is for Colonel Holler. Sir, given a, uh, given a future context that could feature near-peer, high-intensity conflict, denied, degraded environments, prolifer proliferation of unmanned assets, 
The question is, what is the ADA community doing to re revise authorities and command and control so that the engagements are timely and so that we are employing a whole force solution, not just an ADA community, against the threat? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a real good question, and it's something that, that needs to be uh, continually looked at as, as the uh, threat systems advance. Um, you know, the, it's a, a critical part, the authorities piece is a critical part of the area air defense plan uh, for any theater. And um, as, as the, again, as the capabilities advance, we have to look at that and figure out where those authorities need to exist. Um, Uh, General Dixon, uh, back to you for the next question. So, sir, in your comments, you highlighted space and space capabilities supporting uh, multi-domain operations. In fact, your second slide highlighted that for us. Can you provide us some more detail on how space facilitates offensive and defensive integration and enables fires? So, uh, try to keep it succinct. So I would just tell you that uh, the space capabilities, kind of the, uh, that chart that I showed on the multi-domain operations, you know, space capabilities provides uh, detection, early warning uh, in our missile warning enterprise. It also provides threat characterization that's vitally important, and it also enables mission command across vast distances, as I've mentioned earlier, in terms of the tyranny of distance. That comes from a space-based layer space-based layer that can provide uh, persistent and consistent overhead coverage from each of those areas, whether it's intelligence gathering, whether it's uh, satellite communications, whether it's missile warning. And so really, you know, as we get after that and look to the future, it's, it's going to be our ability to leverage that and provide that information in a timely manner to the uh, warfighter on the ground. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, so last year, we, we demonstrated a capability for an, an ISR capability actually out here in the Pacific where we, uh, we demonstrated a, a capability known as Kestrel I. And so small satellite about the size of a dorm room refrigerator that uh, we floated up in the LEO, up in LEO orbit, uh, passed over here a few times a day, but the, the, the utility of that capability was the fact that it was able to pass timely intelligence information from a satellite to a warfighter on the ground and doesn't necessarily need a robust or bureaucratic type of architecture of uh, imagery requests and deliveries. It was responsive, it's responsive to the warfighter on the ground and provide that information that they need in a timely manner. So those are the types of things that we would need in order to, to move into a much more offensive and defensive type of integration for the fires. The ability to see it, the ability to determine what it is, the, the ability to communicate that and then action that in terms of targeting. Thank you, sir. The next question I'll direct to uh, Colonel Montague, uh, but uh, would ask uh, the other panel members uh, if they would uh, also care to comment. So, Monty, where do you see the value of a fully integrated, cross-service, interactive, and automated mission planning enterprise system for both IMAD and ballistic missile defense? Sir, uh, great question. Happy to get the IAMD and ballistic missile defense question as the non-air uh, defender. But uh, in, in all seriousness, I, I think that uh, where I see the value of having a cross-service integrated and partially uh, automated system is in the speed in which it allows you to, on the defensive side, identify threats and prosecute those threats in a timely manner with a system that allows you to prioritize them quickly, and in an offensive manner, allows you to get left of the launch and engage those threats much more quickly. I would say that that capability, that joint, even combined in this theater capability to have a place where all of those entities are existing in, in one space to have those conversations has benefits beyond just uh, IAMD and ballistic missile defense, but it has it imp impacts our ability to operate uh, across the board. The only thing, I, sir, the only thing I would add is, I mean, there's I don't think anybody in here, even folks that really aren't paying attention, would uh, would argue against um, the value of a common operational picture. 
And, you know, and it's simple from my perspective in terms of fire control, which Monty hit, I think, perfectly. But the only thing I would add is fire control in terms of target sharing. If we're all shooting at the same target, for example, we only have so many interceptors. And so, you know, you go Winchester quick. Uh, when you, if you have that capability, you can, you can share that and, and maintain it for the, uh, more of a fight, if that makes sense. But not bad for a non-AMG guy. Yeah. Thanks, sir. So if I could add to that as well, it, it, you know, we're, we're at a point where we've got many sensors across the battlefield. And so whether they're air and missile defense sensors, whether they're field artillery sensors, uh, whether they're joint in terms of Air Force, Navy, or even our allies and partners, we have sensors across the battlefield that we need to make sure that they're integrated on a, a common operating picture, fire control type of network, where we're able to action that uh, intelligence uh, and that information in order to have ultimately the best shooter and the best sensor, or in other words, any shooter, any sensor. Uh, so capabilities that are developing today allow, will allow us to do that. We just have to have a conscious effort amongst the enterprise, the community, the services, our allies and partners that we are moving towards that to have that capability at our, at our hands so that we are able to integrate offensive and defensive fires. See, Monty, I knew you could feel that. I had total confidence in you. <laughs> so uh, we have about uh, time for one more question before we turn it over uh, for Joan Dixon to uh, wrap up our panel today. So I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to ask the uh, $200 million question that many people in this room, certainly in the state of Hawaii, would be thinking. I'm going to direct this to uh, my good friend, General Gabriel. To answer. That's fair. Fair enough. The aviator. So here's the question. Is Hawaii vulnerable to a missile attack? Okay. Is Hawaii vulnerable to a mission or to a missile attack? Yes. So I would um, as, as I think about the answer here, I would say Walking across, if you're not staying in this hotel, if you got to walk across the street, are you vulnerable to get hit by a car? Um, yes and no. Uh, so, and not not to be not to be a you know a smart aleck answer, but I, I would say um, this to be a true statement. And confidence is high, and it was embedded in my comments. Um, the current BMDS. Um, Sist, our, our current BMDS that we have today, confidence is high that we can defeat the current threat adversary, the current threat. The point there is it's very fragile, right? We talked about the evolving threat over the past two days. Um, we talked about um, specifically um, Northern Korea, China, Russia, what, what, what they're developing now, what they have, what they don't have, what they could have. Um, so. It's been said many times, and I talked about the test that we did um, to demonstrate that, that IBCM that we launched during that test was a very threat-oriented um, uh, target, but that was a test. So you fight the enemy, not the test, or you fight the enemy, not the plan. Um, I would say we have very high confidence to answer your question, sir, um, but that that is fragile, and we got to stay ahead of it. Anybody? That's the aviator point of view. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the, those thoughts, sir. I I'd, uh, would, uh, before I turn it over to General Dickinson for uh, closing comments, just want to say, uh, although probably the longest uh, title of any panel, I would submit certainly the most important to not only the United States, but all our partners and allies in the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, and from personal experience of just a couple of years ago when I was sitting in the position to think through some of these wicked problems, uh, it certainly was one that uh, kept us up at night thinking about not only myself but also my bosses, Admiral Locklear and Admiral Harris and all of our allies in the region. So I want to thank uh, AUSA and General Ham, you and your entire team uh, for allowing me to be a part of this again this year. Thank you, sir. And I'll turn it over to General Dixon to close this out. All right, just a couple things here at the end to kind of tie this up, and that is, uh, 
you know, as we look at air and missile defense, integration of offensive and defensive fires, it is, it is all based on our, quite frankly, in this, in this theater, on our partners and allies that we have. The integration of their capabilities, of your capabilities, uh, to build that capacity that I talked about on that first chart. Because when you look over on the right-hand side of that chart, you know, it takes, it'll take all of us in terms of being able to put fires on uh, adversary threats that are coming into the, our defended assets. And so we do that each and every day. And as we look to the future, as we try to build, get to a layered defense from mud to space, meaning from the ground up into the space, using the capabilities that we collectively have, it's a critical that we, uh, we are moving towards an integrated uh, defense capability and the ability to tie those sensors and shooters together so that we not only have a defensive capability but an offensive capability as well. So today it's been, a, been an honor to be here uh, to have the panel. Thank you to the panel members uh, that, that are here today uh, putting, a, putting a, a good spin on all of the uh, things that we're talking about today. Incredibly complicated uh, mission area offensive and defensive integration uh, but I think uh, today we, we got some good dialogue today and some good discussion. So, uh, General Ham, again, thank you for uh, having us today, and uh, thank you. Cool. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for a great, another great panel to, to close us out. You know, General Dickinson, as you talked on that chart and the cost line across the bottom, and the fact is. Uh, your enterprise costs a lot of money. And, and certainly we, we are hoping that you and all that are involved in the enterprise do all you can to, to, to bring those costs in line. But we should also remember there is a cost to not investing in this capability, and that cost is unacceptable. Uh, so we all understand that as well. But thank you all for again for, for a great panel. Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up day two. Uh, coffee will be available at 0700. And we'll start tomorrow morning promptly at 0800. Have a wonderful evening here in Waikiki.